Trans people and it has been unspoken for a long time is that there has been a time in our history when our parents, our grandparents, the parents of our grandparents were just not identifying with the dream of colonial expansion, total war, were enjoying uh, the idea of uh, exploiting and, and making Italy a new and modern through colonial expansion, but all these, you know, that the, they, they were enjoying the promise of uh, yeah, uh, young uh, women, young girls, as a, a war uh, looted, they were enjoying in it. I mean, we have all been laughing for Totobu, you know, it, our national identity even in my lifetime, it, all these legacies is just contemporaneous to us, contemporary to us. It's not something that we address in a far, uh, you know, in a remote uh, uh, past, uh, the uh, Encyclopedia dei Popoli e delle Razze, which is a, a racist kind of anthropology encyclopedia, was republished endless times in post-war Italy. Is is uh, those who were uh, students of anthropology in the 70s studies on that, and it's all about how to measure. People from the Balkans to North Africa uh, to Central Europe and, uh, and prove uh, that racial values are, in a way, an objective reality. The last uh, anti Semitic norm has been abolished just a few years ago about property. We call with no problem uh, um, a very fo uh, popular brand of, of biscuits, Krumiri, and we don't remember. Or, that this is, you know, part of our colonial imagine because they are dark and, and so I think I assume, and this goes back to North Africa and the early 20th century, and that, uh, you know, that's. So I think this is that this is the most intricate thing to address. That this is our own history of our our, our own family time and our own uh, conscience and culture that we should uh, address. Otherwise. There would be always the occasion to talk about something else. Very dirty laundry, something like that. Very national dirty laundry. I have a question for you, and I think it's worth, in the limited time we have, we have many good questions. Maybe we'll do a second session, I don't know. But one thing that is very important is to spend a few words saying what happened to Graziani after the war. So he was sentenced to 19 years. He served only four of these 19 years. He was not sentenced for Africa. Why? Because I think if we know a little bit more, we might understand. You spoke on the cultural side, which is obviously very important. It reminded me, growing up, there was a, a book that somebody gave me that was called Popoli Primitivi Oggi, Primitive People Today. And the, the, the dedication to me, it must have been eight or nine years old, was esperiamo non domani, let's hope they won't be primitive people. So that, this is a cultural thing, but this is not just cultural. We're talking about history and dealing with its own history. So what happened to Graziani? Let's, let's take it as an example, because unfortunately there are thousands and thousands of Grazianis and Badoglios in the history of Italy. So. According to the United Nations War Crimes Commission that operated from 1943 to 1949, there were at least 2,000 Italian war criminals. Uh, all of them, <coughs> most of them, were classified as A criminals, which meant that in case of trial, the commission expected that there would be uh, con their, uh, the charges against them would be highly uh, proved. So, uh, Italian war criminals for uh, crimes committed during the Second World War in the occupied countries and in Ethiopia were never uh, brought to trial, as we all uh, know. Graziani was, um, there was a trial, but it was a trial for, uh, the charge was uh, regarding his collaboration with the Nazis in, during the Republic of Salo for, uh, having directed the Italian war, um, armed forces for counterinsurgency operations against Italian partisans. So it was, and uh, he was never charged of or, or brought to uh, justice for colonial crimes. Here, I think, and this is the transnational that I was mentioning at the in my um, 
intervention. I think that this is not just an Italian case. The Ethiopian crimes, the, the Italian war crimes in Ethiopia, as I said, were uh, became well, you know, known and doc well documented since the uh, mid 1930s. The British, uh, uh, of course, you know, uh, the British never. Uh, Favor in a way the the, the idea of uh, international trials for uh, cr war crimes committed in the colonial war in Ethiopia. This is a time of not of you know of, of in, uh, dramatic conflict, all of global conflict when the anti-colonial uh, movements spread all over uh, the world, and uh, the British Empire was. Uh, facing this huge crisis of legitimacy, and I think this is why in the 1930s and soon after the Second World War, among many other reasons, there was also the idea that maybe the United War Crimes Commission could investigate for cri Italian crimes committed in Yugoslavia, in Greece, in Albania, but uh, the British even um, uh, resisted the idea that the Ethiopian case could be included in the investigations conducted by the United Nations War Crimes Commission. So it remained, you know, a colonial, uh, there was a colonial preoccupation, I think. The other reason that is always uh, suggested is that, and it has been also documented,